Ryan Stanton here with ASEP Frontline, joined today by Dr. James Neuenschwander, a research director um, at the Ohio State University, adjunct associate professor. Um, so just one state north of us, but I actually met him, uh, ran into him down in Destin, Florida, which is an interesting turn of events. And now we wanted to catch up because he's doing some interesting stuff uh, related to some uh, interrogation. And I don't mean the dun dun dun, dun type with the uh, bright lights and that sort of thing. Um, so we'll get right to it. Uh, thanks for joining us here on the front line. Sure, Ryan. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about this project and what you are working towards, because it sounds like it's uh, more than anything a labor of love for you, but um, hopefully to uh, improve uh, practices for all of us in emergency medicine. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm the research director at Genesis Healthcare Systems in Zanesville, Ohio, and then an adjunct associate professor at Ohio State. So I work in a community hospital. We see about 72,000 patients a year in our emergency department. And one of the things I looked at after training at Johns Hopkins in emergency medicine was that about 90% of all publications came out of the 10% of emergency departments that were academic. And I thought we really need to do more research in community settings to kind of get some of the information out or to deal with some of the issues that we face that are somewhat unique to community hospitals and not so much to academic centers. So one of the problems that we have in community settings is that it's hard to get a pacemaker or ICD checked or interrogated because oftentimes the reps aren't that close to that community hospital or they're too far away to make it something that's, that's going to be convenient. So tell us about, uh, it's kind of funny because our, our rep here who is actually in town, he, he, there, especially one in particular, he always tells us, are you sure you need it tonight? Um, I'm like, this is the emergency department. We aren't just going to wait till tomorrow so you can get your beauty rest because uh, honestly, there's not enough we can get you to fix everything. But, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, it's always a huge hesitance uh, with, the, with these device reps to come in and actually uh, interrogate these things. So what did you figure out, what kind of solutions did you find in terms of being able to get the information we need? Uh, because the vast majority of us are in community settings, so we're going to be dealing with this more often than not uh, with regards to uh, all these folks coming in with uh, electrical issues associated with their pacemakers. Well, I think one of the interesting things I found out in the whole process is that those reps don't get reimbursed for the visits to the emergency department. So there's really a strong disincentive for them to get up at 11 o'clock or two o'clock in the morning when we're all working and taking care of these patients. So contrary to popular beliefs, when they come in, they're not getting paid for that time. And as a matter of fact, it probably is going to take some money out of their pocket because the next day when they could be helping implant these devices, they're not actually working. So one of the things that we found early on was that there was information within these devices pertaining to heart failure or you know whether they had been shocked or not shocked. And it really didn't take much to get that information from them. When we first started, we were doing the interrogations with programmers themselves, which made some people very nervous because they said, oh no, you're gonna uh, reset their pacemakers or you're gonna turn off their shock function and you know it's gonna be terrible. You're gonna be killing people. You shouldn't be doing this. But we found you know, pretty early on with the first couple studies that we could check these things, get information back that was useful, and then manage our patients better as a result of it. So how did you, what is the pro- process by which, because now we've started noticing in our emergency department, we have a couple of machines that'll pick up some of the newer versions of, of these and, and do some interrogation, and then it gets back, back to us uh, where it ends up uh, directly in the chart. How are you guys uh, getting this, this data and uh, how fast is that turnaround? Well, so initially we started out, we were working with these companies. So in in full disclosure, I have consulted for Abbott, which is formerly St. Jude, Boston Scientific and Medtronic. And when we started looking at uh, doing this research, we actually took the programmers themselves and were checking patients in the emergency department. And then we went back to these companies and said, hey, listen, we can do this. One of our first studies, we used a uh, programmer in the emergency department. And what we found during the day was that whether the emergency department used a programmer or we had a pacemaker clinic nurse or a rep come in, it was about the same amount of time. But during evenings or weekends or holidays, we could get the information so much faster, almost you know three hours more quickly. So that whole thing about the rep not coming in and then having to admit somebody for an interrogation in quotation marks, 
we, you know, we're not doing that anymore. So when we started working with these companies, we said, hey, this could be a real value to you all as well in that you're sending people in, they're not getting reimbursed. Why don't you build some of these things so that we can just have them in our possession and then we can check them and you can send the reports either to the reps or you can have somebody on overnight that can read them and then you're going to keep your people out of the hospital, off the roads, and it'll be a win-win for everyone. What did you, I mean, you mentioned some of the time turnarounds that you uh, that you found out and some of the benefit there. How was it accepted? And then what did you see in terms of that patient experience in the emergency department, being able to come in and get this thing checked out in the department? Patients love it. Staff love it because we can do it so much more quickly. I mean, we, we wrote up a case report while we were doing one of the studies of a, a gentleman that came in. It was a Saturday and he uh, had been shocked. We checked his labs, we checked his pacemaker because he was randomized to the group that we were actually checking ourselves. And uh, he was in and out of the hospital, Ryan, in 90 minutes. We had somebody else later that very same day who uh, came to the hospital and was randomized to have the rep check them. They waited over, I think it was uh, three and a half, four hours because the rep was over in Lima, Ohio. Don't say anything bad about Lima, I'm from there. So it was, you know, all this time that they're waiting and the staff were even calling me like, come on, Nui, don't make us wait. Can't we just put him in the other arm? Why can't we just check him ourselves? And, you know, that's why you do research is to show that if we did the interrogation, we could do it very rapidly in less than two hours. And in many cases, actually, the process itself takes less than 10 minutes now that we have the read-only devices versus waiting for hours and hours and hours. And, and you know, some hospitalists or, or internal medicine people won't let you admit the patient until they know that the device is working okay. So for us, it's been wonderful in that we can check the devices. Patients can go home more rapidly. We know if there's an issue, if there's not an issue. And uh, staff love it because people aren't sitting around and waiting for uh, reps to come in or the pacemaker clinic nurses to come check them. So it's, it, everybody likes it. Have you noticed any difference in the data that you're getting or any challenges issue with us getting it versus trying to convince that rep to come in uh, and give us an extra three hours? Is, I mean, I assume the data is going to be very similar to what I'm going to get versus that three-hour timeline. No, the data is almost exactly the same, and we can pretty much gather all the information we need. We've, we have now worked with each of these three companies, and St. Jude, Boston Scientific, and Medtronic all have these remote read-only devices that can check pacemakers and ICDs. So pretty much now when anybody comes in, they get their EKG, that gets taken to the emergency physician. And then our techs are the people that do most of the interrogations. They just go check the device and find out if there's anything wrong in it. And the information is relayed to us very quickly, and, and we utilize that in our care and workup. We've started, uh, I think we, we started with just one machine, and I think we've got one, one for all of the common uh, producers at this point, and uh, we find that works on most of them, but uh, older-based pacemakers had a gentleman come in a week or so ago with an older pacemaker. Uh, it, it didn't want to read it initially, and so we ended up having to get the rep involved, and of course, he gave me that answer of, well, can it wait till the morning? Can you just admit the patient? And and we'll come in and do it tomorrow. I was like, yeah, you know, it, you may not be getting paid for it, but that's a lot of cost for somebody. If I just put them in the hospital, just the wait for you guys to come in uh, and check something is there. Are we finding that these are pretty much uh, across the board picking up? Is there an age cut off or, or is it going to keep up with the newer products that are coming out? What type of upkeep is necessary on them? Uh, just really once once we get this distributed more widely, how do, how do we make sure that it stays pretty uni universally covered? Well, uh, so a couple different things is that, number one, we can get all the information that we need. And number two, most of the devices now can be read with the remote readers. One of the interesting things is, and I'm sure you've faced this in your own clinical practice, I know I have, is that if you try to use the wrong reader type on a device, it won't read it. So in essence, only... Boston Scientific readers will read Boston Scientific pacemakers, and only Medtronic will read Medtronic, only Abbott will read Abbott. And so one time, you know, occasionally what will happen is we get patients who come in and we'll ask them what kind of box they have. And we actually did a research project. It was pretty small numbers, 106 patients, and we just interviewed all of them that came to the emergency department for any complaint, whether they had their ID cards with them. And, and what percentage of those patients do you think had the ID cards, Ryan? I'm going to say 60%. That's about right. It was 55%, which is incredible to me that somebody would have a life-saving device in their chest and have no idea who makes it. 
you know, and then we'd ask them, you know, is it Boston? No, is it Medtronic? Oh, Medtronic. Yeah, I think that's it. And then we'd find out that they, you know, we'd call it the Medtronic rep in and they would have a Boston scientific device, but a Medtronic lead mm-hmm. and the Medtronic rep couldn't check the Boston device. So it's important to know what kind of device they have so that you do check it with the right interrogator. So right now there's three different brands that are the major uh, implanters in the United States. And we have all three of those boxes because we've worked with each of those three companies in developing this technology. And, um, you know, it's been very successful for us. In technology. So right now I'm, I'm, we're communicating uh, on, off of my Mac, um, with uh, we have communications with Mac, we have Windows, we have you know, and and those sorts of things, and they all communicate with each other. Is there any point where we're getting to to designing one that can adjust itself and you know translate via whatever it is to read it, no matter what company it is? So basically, a universal translator. You know, that's really the holy grail. I've been doing this work since about uh, two thousand two, working with these companies and. To say that they hate each other would probably be mild. I don't know what it is about them. They don't trust each other. They don't like each other. They don't want to share anything that would potentially disclose their data or algorithms. So getting them to say, hey, let's all work together and put one, you know, iPad together with three different uh, wands that could be checked on uh, somebody's device. But I think we're starting to make some progress. They are starting to work together in some ways, but this still remains one thing that they haven't agreed upon, but I'm hoping today and, and all the other work that we're doing that will someday show them, hey, if we could do this safely, it's definitely worth doing because so many people are asking for it. We were just at the Society of Academic Emergency Medicine and presented a paper there, a poster rather, and um, that was the first question we got is, can we get one of these that covers all three? And the answer is no right now, but hopefully in the future. Yeah, I would hate for I would, I would hate for patient care to get in get in the way of uh, a good feud. You know, that's 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 always good to work out for everybody. Well, yeah, let's 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 make things more difficult just so you guys can sling poo at each other. Um, with these, and, and as I mentioned, I, I didn't realize that we had started off with one and have all three of them now. In, in my department, we're a heart center. And it is very helpful, as I mentioned, most of the time, vast majority of the time, I can get the information pretty quickly. Generalizable, I mean, what is the stages of getting this accessible around the country to community emergency departments and anywhere and everywhere where this is going to be? Because it seems like something that the companies would push pretty hard to kind of take some of the strain and timing off of their staff. Yeah, so there's a couple of different things. Um, number one, it has been a somewhat slow adoption, which has surprised me in that a lot of places don't feel like they want the reader anyways, because most of the time that somebody comes in, they're going to need some type of adjustment. We published something recently, and actually we're working on the manuscript right now, that 96% of the time we check these devices, there was nothing that immediately needed to be done. Now, probably if you look at other data and other literature, that's consistent with it up to about 10%. So somewhere between 4 and 10% of the time that we actually check one of these things, does some adjustment need to be made to either the pacemaker or ICD? So the first thing is just getting people comfortable with the fact that most of the time that we check these, nothing really needs to be done. So we can check these the vast majority of times and no intervention is needed. So you don't need to have the rep there. And the nice thing is, is if you do need the rep, then they will come in and they come in much more readily than the situation that you're talking about. So, you know, we've had the goal was to have no reps have to come in and check any of our devices in 2018. And we were pretty darn close to that. I think we had almost none have to come in to check. Now, they did have to come in occasionally, and that was very rarely, again, that they needed to come in and adjust something. So one of the other things, though, is knowing what the penetration is of pacemakers and ICDs in your area. So if you have, like most places, Medtronic has the the greatest penetration. Most of the devices are Medtronic. So if you just started out with a Medtronic read only, which is called a CareLink Express, then you would be able to probably to check the majority of your patients. The challenge with that is that Medtronic actually charges a monthly fee to utilize that piece of equipment, which is interesting because their two competitors, Abbott and Boston, do not charge for the device. They have figured that it's actually more cost efficient to just give the departments the equipment and then they keep their people off the road and they feel like it's helpful to them. Uh, I mean, that seems like a dumb sell to say we're going to 
we're going to put these in, charge the patient, all this stuff, and then we're going to charge you to check our work and to ensure this that it's working properly. And with with all of this, I mean, when you're talking about the the number that uh, needs to actually have adjustment, the vast vast majority that I see don't need anything. Really, what we're doing is just seeing if the in most cases, whether the pacemaker has anything to do with what they came in for, whether it was a syncopal episode, whether it was some uh, palpitations, whether it may be, it's really just to rule out and say, hey, your pacemaker, AICD, everything's working fine. Or in the case of an AICD, it did exactly what it needed to do. Uh, and it gave you the chance to do what it needed to do uh, without you knowing it. And then you kept doing this. And so it fixed the problem for you. And that's what brought you here. So it's really no nothing uh, to adjust to it. And it does make a huge difference for us that we can get that. In fact, our nurses uh, now more than any other time have the report available by the time the patient really is back in the room. We are part of the triage process. They're bringing up the device scanning it and, and having that report available pretty quickly because we get the preliminary report and then you get the full report for some of them and uh, that's available either in the chart or you get a call from the rep that says hey everything's fine i'm sending you the facts or whatever it may be but you know with your argument that we're not getting it adopted pretty consistently across the board sounds like those administrators and c-suite folks that seem to think that the hospital still only functions nine to five monday through friday when everybody is available you know the whole idea when we would make our debates for having availability to rsi and anesthesia was well you don't need to do that we're available are you available 2 a.m on christmas morning oh no we're not available then so once you start to uncover the real life of emergency medicine they seem to come around and say oh wait a second that it, it truly is a 24 7 365 operation and unless we want to inconvenience and make this more difficult and have staff turnover, we need to make sure that we have their tools available as much as possible. And, and having these, especially with the big pushes recently on boarding, back-end processes, and everything like that. I mean, we just did a, a podcast down there in Destin talking about a local hospital that's got 30,000 hours per month of boarding. That comes out to about 44 patients per 24 hours every single day. And, you know, if, if I can make a two or three hour difference, that's in most emergency departments, that's a patient, that's a bed, a patient, a complete turnover that you can now bring in and the cost effectiveness of that. Uh, that's where your bean counters start to say, hey, yeah, this does make a little bit more sense. And that's really, Ryan, what we use to sell our C-suite folks on purchasing and renting or, or leasing the um, Medtronic device, which is essentially a, an iPad with a wand attached to it. Uh, we, we've really felt that there was great value in, in getting that, and it's been very, very helpful. One of the cool things that we've done recently, now that you have all three, we actually wanted to see what would happen if you put the wrong one on uh, the wrong device. So if you had an Abbott pacemaker, what would happen if you put a Boston or a Medtronic reader on it? We'd always heard these kind of urban legends that it would break the device or something would go wrong. So we actually got each one of those three companies to give us 25 boxes that were not in a patient, but were like either pacemakers, ICDs, pacemaker ICDs, different models from different years. And then we checked them with the uh, mismatched interrogator. So we took the Abbott's and checked them with Boston Medtronic. We took the Boston and checked them with the Medtronic and Abbott and then Medtronic with Abbott and Boston. We did that 20 with the 25 different devices, checked them each time in between with the appropriate programmer and found that it didn't do anything to the devices. And then we went into the pacemaker clinic and found 10 live patients with each brand and checked them with mismatched interrogators and then rechecked them again and found that there's nothing wrong with checking a box with the wrong type of interrogator. Did you let them know? They say, we're going to try this. We're pretty sure it's going to be fine. But if not, you get this visit for free. Yeah, there was something like that. I mean, we, they were already in the pacemaker clinic. They had been checked. Everything was fine. If anything blew up or there was a nuclear explosion, we had a uh, cardiologist next door drinking coffee that could help them, I'm sure. We'll send a large bouquet of flowers to your family apologizing for the experimental research that you have participated in today. So I was just going to say we were IRB approved. I mean, we consented to them. We told them that there was some chance because, you know, obviously, as you're saying, most about half the emergency physicians I talk to say that you cannot check somebody's Boston Scientific with a Medtronic reader or something will go wrong. And it's just not true. Well, that's a, that's probably the same folks that also still think that if you have somebody with a pacemaker walk by a microwave that they explode. And I'm, I've never seen anybody cook 
uh, with a pacemaker or going through the airport, uh, having that little scanner drop people dead left and right. So, I mean, it sounds like they got a, a pretty tight coverage on these. Where do you see all this going? What are the next steps for monitoring and evaluation in the emergency department? Well, I would like to see more emergency departments adopt this technology. One of the, our future studies that we want to look at, as we've seen already in some kind of small numbers that we've worked with, is that if somebody comes in with a trauma above their waist, even just like minor trauma, we had a patient who had been kicked by her grandchild and it dislodged the lead from her ICD. And when we checked it, we saw that there was something wrong. I don't know, actually, I'm not sure it was an ICD or if it was a pacemaker, but it was something had come undone essentially is what it was. So I think that any place that treats trauma, which is every emergency department that has somebody that comes in with trauma, should be checked. And these things are easy to have in your possession, easy to keep in the emergency department. And if they uh, come in for any reason that, you know, they think they faint, if they fainted, they feel tired, if they've had syncope, if there's, you know, if they're short of breath, there's heart failure data contained within these that can be useful in helping us make our diagnosis. So I would like to see every emergency department have these read-only devices. You don't have to worry about disabling or turning off somebody's device or reprogramming it. And then ultimately, I'd love to see these companies come together and us have one universal reader so that anybody that comes in can be checked. And we don't need to have three different carrying cases and have to worry about calling the company or, or checking them with the wrong device because that's just going to take time. What is the onboarding process? Is it Are these machines something that uh, have a pretty steep learning curve, or is it like the AED that is, that is basically made for the lowest common denominator? I mean, they're pretty much idiot-proof. All you have to do is drop the wand on, you know, in, in most of these cases, it either lights up and tells you that it's communicating with the device, or if it's not the right kind of device, or in your case, as you mentioned, that it's too old, that it won't light up at all. And then, you know, you just move on and either realize it's too old a device, or you just go find the right reader. But it's so easy. I mean, it, it's like five steps. You push a button to interrogate. You either send it via Bluetooth or a fax to the company, and then the company has a rep call you and interpret the data for you, which, you know, many times, as you're aware, is that they just say, hey, it's working fine, no problems. Or they had a uh, run of VTAC, they appropriately were shocked, and they can go home. Or one of the craziest things, and I know this is probably something, is that we'll have something called a phantom shock, where <laughs> they think they got shocked, but they didn't, which, you know, is incredible to me that somebody could mistake 30 joules of electricity directly applied to their myocardium for something else. But you know, when you're falling asleep and you kind of shake like that and you go, oh, I think I got shocked. And they come in, we check them and they didn't get shocked. Those people are going home. And it's great because we can say, hey, listen, the device is working fine. You didn't get shocked. Go home and rest. Everything's cool. So this is easy technology. It's easy to get into the department. Not a whole lot of onboarding uh, involved. And do you see this adoption picking up pretty pretty soon? Or is it something that you're going to continue to see feet dragging to the point that these companies may second guess having this stuff available? That's a great question. I see Medtronic and Boston really bought in. I think St. Jude has had some more difficulty supporting this. They were purchased by Abbott. And I don't know that there's been as much support for this arm of their technology. So I don't know. I, I would definitely say that Boston and Medtronic are on board St. Jude, it'll be interesting to see if they uh, step up their game and want to make these more readily available to you know healthcare providers or not. But I think all of them eventually will see the value in it. It's just a matter of time. And, and, and it, there are more and more, there's a greater and greater adoption for this technology. Well, and honestly, you know, I talked about the one that had the really old pacemaker uh, that wouldn't pick up with the reading device. And actually, apparently it had been kind of hit or miss on whether it would pick up or not. But uh, really having a really old pacemaker suggests it's actually working great or they didn't need it to begin with. So if you're that far out, you probably got some pretty good pretty good data that it's doing its job as much as, it, as possible. So talking with Dr. James Neuenschwander, Research Director, Genesis Healthcare System, Adjunct Associate Professor of the Ohio State University. Is it, are you going to tell me it's the Ohio State with the capital T-H-E, or is it? are you okay with it just being the Ohio State? Well, actually, I went to another state college in Ohio, Kent State. So it's really hard for me to describe Ohio State as the Ohio State University when there's a lot of other great state universities in Ohio. But my daughter's a senior there, and obviously... 
I've worked there and, and still do research with those guys. But yeah, it's, that's that's kind of a, a tough one. I agree that they sound pretty pretentious. We're just going to call it Ohio State University at this point. That works for me. Hey, I do want to throw in a, a special shout out, Ryan, if I can, to yeah, um, sure. Brian Heaston, who has helped me a great deal with the research and mentoring me, and Frank Peacock as well. And, you know, it, it was Frank that inspired me to this. I remember having a conversation with him one day and he said, hey, listen, emergency medicine is, is a new practice, is a new specialty compared to so many of the other specialties. It's our responsibility to make sure that we're doing something to elevate our specialty. It's our responsibility to make sure that when we leave emergency medicine, it's better than when we found it. And I think that you know, this wasn't an original idea of mine. I don't, I'm, I'm no hero. I'm not even that great a scientist, frankly. Yet, I do think this has improved the lives of my patients. I believe it's improved the ability for us to provide better care for them and their families, our community. And I hope it does make emergency medicine better. And, and that's why it's a labor of love. And how can folks get in touch with you if they have more questions there at one of the Ohio State Universities? Uh, can reach me at gmail, jim.neuen at gmail.com, jim.neuen at gmail.com, or Facebook, the new MD, which is uh, T H E N E U M D uh, at Facebook. All right, we'll let you have the the on front of you, but we're going to continue to call it one of the Ohio State Universities. As for me, you can contact me, youreverydaymedicine@gmail.com, youreverydaymedicine at gmail dot com. Speaking of email, that's uh, that's probably karma right there. And until next time, I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton, and this has been some ASAP Frontline.